Okay, so we're holding Tehillim, Psalms, Perek Kufyu, chapter 119. This is the longest chapter, and it's divided by the Aleph Bet. So tonight we're going to be doing the letters Zayn, Chet, and Tet. I began to explain that this chapter is focused on the Torah, on the importance of the Torah being something strength, central to, in a Jew's life. Because it's so central, it's so important, it's after all the guide by which we live our lives. We can't be without it. Imagine without a road map, how are you going to get around? How are you going to reach your final destination? But people forget. People are distracted and they don't realize the importance of the centrality of Torah in a Jew's life. So David Melech pretty much dedicates this chapter not only to remind us of that, but also to keep in mind that there will be many, many struggles for a Jew to continuously learn Torah, to observe the Torah, because there will be many, many things that will try to interfere, disrupt him. And all of that, of course, has to do with the Yetzirah, the evil inclination, whose job is that you should not accomplish whatever your mission is. Now, even though every one of us has a unique mission, the general mission of the entire Jewish people, what we all have in common, is the Torah. The Torah is what binds us together. So no one can ever say, this does not apply to me. This only applies to the big rabbis. It is for them to learn Torah. That's not so. So what we're going to see tonight is, instead of the typical interruptions or things that distract the Jew from Torah, excuses. A lot of times, people come up with excuses of why they can't learn Torah, or why they can't observe mitzvot, because of challenges, because of difficulties. They forget that the difficulties are there as a test, as a challenge. It's not that Hashem allowed this difficulty to prevent you from observing a mitzvah. Hanukkah is coming up. The Greeks decreed against the Jews not to observe certain mitzvot. They're trying to do that today in Europe too. Oh, no more circumcision. You have to ask permission from that little baby. You can't just do that to him. That's so cruel. The same thing with Shekita, with slaughter of animals. Decrees. So what is the Jew supposed to do? Just say, well, I have to accept it. That's life. You can't fight City Hall. See what I mean? Similar situations, whereas in the past, perhaps we were in physical danger, but today still, they want to prevent us from observing the mitzvot. Now, what do you think it is? It's just that somebody got up in the morning, he didn't have anything better to do. He was bored and said, let's make a decree, right? Against the Jews. What was wrong till now? You had circumcision for all these years. Why did they get up one morning? So we forget sometimes that this is a test from above, a challenge. Are we going to protest? Are we going to do something about it? And just accept it and say we have no choice. So in this chapter, a great deal of this chapter, talks about all kinds of distractions, things that attempt to interfere with us, whether it's enemies of all kinds, or whether it's all kinds of struggles. But it also excuses that we come up on our own from the Yetzirah. I have a whole lecture about excuses and rationalizations and justifications of why one would not want to do a mitzvah or embrace the Torah and so on. So I'm going to start just with a brief story that will give you an example of some of what he's going to say. Eliyahu Navi, you heard about him, right? Eliyahu, the prophet, once met up with a fisherman. He didn't tell who he was. And he sees that the fisherman is busy fishing. That's what he's doing. And he asks him, how is life, how are things? He said, everything is fine, thank God. I have a livelihood from the fishing. And he says, what about Torah? Do you learn Torah? Do you devote some of the time of the day to the Torah? He says, sir, I'm sorry, but God did not give me the brains for Torah. He says, really? Well, oh, that's your excuse. Uh -huh. Tell me, how do you catch fish? Oh, he says, you want to know? I do it from scratch. I plant flax. And once I harvest the flax, I make strong nets. You know, from flax, you can make really strong nets. And I use those nets to catch the fish. So that's interesting, Eliana, he says. You mean to say God gave you the brains for that, but not for Torah? It's just an excuse. You don't need that much brains for Torah. Obviously, Torah, there's different levels. There's even deep Torah, like Kabbalah. 
And obviously, it's not meant for everyone to be proficient in Torah, because obviously God knows we need people who will devote much of their time to be plumbers, architects, lawyers, obviously. So we need rabbis, we need teachers too. But you're not being asked to be proficient, to be an expert here. You're being asked to devote some time. Because otherwise, without even a few minutes of Torah during the day, you will run into many problems. Problem number one, you won't have the strength to fight your Yetzirah, your evil inclination. When one learns Torah, he's reminded. He's reminded of who he is, what he's here for, what his life all about, and it has meaning and purpose. And he's reminded of the fact that he's responsible. He's not just another animal. He's responsible. He's the crown of creation. And there's a lot expected of him in his 70, 80 years over here. A lot. Not everything. They don't expect you to be the wealthiest man in the world. If it's not in your mazal written that you're going to be very, very wealthy, you are not going to be, no matter how hard you try. That's mazal. Mazal is not up to us. You do have free will. You're not an animal that only functions by instinct. And that free will, hopefully, will enable you to be a righteous man, a good name. This is what you need to earn for yourself. A good name, a good reputation. Observe the Torah mitzvot to do your best abilities. So if you don't learn Torah, even a few minutes, how are you going to remember this? How are you going to fight the Yetzirah who tries to cool you off? And how are you going to know what to do? Shabbat is not easy. There's a lot of details, a lot of halachot. So we need the Torah for direction. We need the Torah also for encouragement. And that's what the Vida Menes is going to talk about briefly in this chapter too. How he was encouraged when he learned Torah. How it reminded him. That's why these Pesukim, these verses are brief, but I call them snippets. Small snippets of reminders that the Vida Menes would say to remind himself of what he went through. And of course, so that we should avail ourselves from these snippets that are very, very useful in our life too. So, from the story of Eliyahu Navi, we learn something very, very important. Anybody that says he has no time whatsoever, or no brains whatsoever for Torah, it's an excuse. A few minutes, we all have a few minutes. <coughs> the problem is that a lot of people prefer to use those few free minutes on reading the sports section of the LA Times, or seeing the fake news. <laughs> or entertaining themselves with something which is not that significant in their life. So they claim they have no, no time left. But what did you use that time for? So when we learn Torah, and Tehillim is very interesting because Tehillim consists of not just prayers and praises, but also this is Torah because it gives us a certain sense of direction. The Vira Melech is telling this to future generation. Take it from me, I was the king. I was very busy. You are. You're not as busy as I was. And you, have, you did not even go through half of what I went through. The struggles, the enemies that I had. You can derive a lot of encouragement from David Melech. This is why he put together this book. Partially to encourage those who go through similar experiences not to give up. Regardless of how hard it is, it's, remember it's all a test, it's a challenge. God will never demand of you something which is beyond your means. Something which is too difficult, you're not going to be demanded to do that. Whatever you're being put through, you can handle it. And hopefully, with direction, you will be successful. So we're holding Ot Zayn. If you want to follow, beginning with verse Memtet, 49. So loosely translated, we can say, remember the word that you promised me, to promise to your servant, by which you gave me hope. So what is he saying here? The fact that I remember what you promised, whether it was what Hashem promised indirectly, whether it was the words of the prophets, what they promised us, this gave us tremendous hope. Imagine Jews going through persecution years ago. Years ago, it was very, very difficult. They turned to the words of the prophets and they would derive hope from it. This is what would give them hope that one day, and it could be any moment, they're gonna leave this galut, they're going to leave this exile and go back to Israel. If you've been living 200 years ago, imagine in, whether in Isfahan or in some other city in Europe where there was really a lot of persecution, and you would say, when is this going to end? I don't see anything in sight. Nobody can say that today. It's over 7 million Jews in Israel. What's that? They just decided to come now? These are the prophecies fulfilling themselves. This gives us hope. 
He's supposed to at least. But people are not paying attention, they're asleep. So the Abid says, this gave me hope. The words that you promised gave me hope. Zod Nechamati, verse 50. Zod Nechamati be'oni ki imratecha chiyatni. This is my comfort in my affliction. He went through a lot of affliction. For your word has given me life. So the words of the Torah, as we said earlier, give encouragement, they give life, they remind us of that which we forget sometimes. For example, people sometimes are insulted by others. They get hurt, they have a financial loss. They can easily give up hope. They may even try to run away and do all kinds of terrible things. Without Torah, that's what may happen. With Torah, you're going to say, wait a minute, this is a kapara. If anything, this maybe I deserve this. This is a tremendous atonement. Thank you, Hashem, for it. Obviously, we don't want atonements like that. We don't want to go through affliction or suffering. But this is what the Bible says. If you are going through it already, you don't have a choice, to say. Therefore, zot hamati. This is my consolation. This is my comfort. Your word has given me life. Next verse, Nun Aleph. Here's another example of a situation that he faced from time to time where people wanted to discourage him, cool him off by making fun of him. Even though their intent was not necessarily to cool him off, but that is ultimately what would happen if somebody did not have hope, did not have trust in God. Zedim hinetsuni ad me'od mitoratechalo latiti Though the wicked, Zedim are wicked, evildoers, they ridicule me severely. I have not strayed from your Torah. Yeah, it could easily happen to the ones who are weak. There are some people who are very weak in Emunah, weak in nature. They don't have the strength to resist the social pressures. They are the ones that fall fast. Especially if there's a storm. What kind of a storm? A spiritual storm, like a Holocaust. After the Holocaust, where a lot of people saw their own family butchered, they just snapped. When I say snapped, I don't know what it means psychologically. A lot of people lost it. It created tremendous uh, shock in their life, and they just lost it. Similar to soldiers who saw their buddies being killed next to them. They saw a bomb falling not too far from them. It puts them through shock. But these people are also very, very depressed, disappointed. Where was God? How did he allow this to happen? You have a very powerful storm. A hurricane is a powerful storm, right? This is a spiritual hurricane because of what happened. A lot of them just let go of their Judaism. Their roots were shallow at home. They were never strong to begin with. So all you needed was a big wind, and they just fell. They couldn't resist. They couldn't somehow gather the strength to continue their life. Because how could this happen? They had no answers. They didn't learn. They were ignorant. Their roots were not strong. They couldn't take it anymore. We're not going to blame anyone, of course. We're, we don't know what we would do if we were in their shoes. So we're not blaming. We're just explaining that the stronger the roots are, the more learned one is, the more one's faith is pure, the better the chances, it's not a guarantee, but the better the chances that he will be able to weather the storm. So here he says, look, I have to deal with mockers, scorners, evil people, wicked people, who ridiculed me. And a lot of people, because of the ridicule, they don't do teshuva, they don't want to stand out, they don't want to wear a kippah, oh, looks funny. Did somebody die in the family that you're wearing a head cover? You know, they usually see head covers at funerals. So when they see somebody coming for the first time to work one day, covering his head because he's doing Teshuvah, what happened? You think something had happened? You know what happened? I became smarter. That's what happened. I realized that this is very good. This is very special. It reminds me that he is the boss. We need reminders. So he says, he faced these people who tried to cool him off, who tried to dissuade him from doing what he was doing, making fun of him. So that was the type of challenge that he had from time to time. But he didn't fall for it. I didn't let go of your Torah just because of that. I continued. Is he only speaking to himself or is he speaking to us? You see, this is why I did. This is how I reacted. 
פסוק נ"ב, 52. זכרתי משפטיך מעולם אדוני ואת נחם. When I remember your judgments of old, Hashem, I take comfort. Mishpatecha here means judgment or punishment. When I see what you've done elsewhere to the wicked, and what other people have gone through in the past, me'olam, v'ayit necham, this also gives me comfort. I realize that yesh din ve'yesh dayan. I realize, hey, if I look through history, there was judgment. It's not like, why are these evildoers getting away with it? Yes, if you look at only one segment of the movie, you'll be puzzled. But sir, you should have been here at the beginning of the movie, or at least for the entire movie from the beginning. You would have a better understanding, but nobody lives that long to understand what's going on in the world, because we were not here at the beginning of the movie. It's a long movie, over 5,000 years. We come at the end, oh, it's not fair. <laughs> sir, where were you? It's like Hashem telling Yov, Yov had certain issues with what Hashem was doing in his world. Yov, did you see my blueprint for the creation? That you want to figure out why things are the way they are? I never shared my blueprint with you. You want to see the blueprint? You first have to go upstairs. Oh, no, no, I don't want to do that. <laughs> I don't want to go upstairs before my time. Yeah, when people go upstairs, then they understand a little bit better. They have more clarity. So David Amelech says here, Regardless of the situation, I know even though things are tough and it appears that the evildoers are getting away with it. No, I know from the past. I see Mishpatecha Me'olam. I read history. I see that there was judgment on the wicked. Therefore, that gives me Nechama, that gives me some comfort in understanding that you're still around. Plus, it gives me comfort that I realize that everything is for the good. Everything serves a purpose. Nothing happens in a random way. Pasuk Nun Gimel 53. This is a very interesting verse. First of all, the first word is very unusual. You won't find it. Zila'afa. Trembling. I think that's the best translation. Trembling seized me because of the wicked those who forsake you, Torah. So you can say, simply stated, that David Melech feels bad. He's very sad. He says, how could people be so bad? How could people do the wrong thing? It bothers me so much to see them doing what they're doing. I tremble. But he wouldn't use the word tremble if he was just bothered. You know why he says here trembling? He says, if the tzaddikim, if righteous people suffered from minor things relatively, can you imagine what's going to happen to the Rashaim, to the wicked? Just because you don't see anything happening to them doesn't mean anything. On the contrary, you should learn from the fact that Sadiqim are going through difficulties. If they have to pay for what they did, and usually minor things, can you imagine what the wicked ones are going to have to pay? Just because you don't see it in your life, that doesn't mean they're not going to be having to pay. It's, there's going to be payday one day. If not here, then upstairs. So Zila'afa Hazatni he says, I tremble from the Reshaim of Zvei Torah, those who are wicked, who have left the ways of the Torah. If Tzadikim have to pay for their minor sins, can you imagine what's going to happen to them? Verse Nun 54. Zemirot Ayuli Chukecha Bevet Megurai. If you have it, verse 54, Nun Dalet. Your statutes have been my songs in the house of my wanderings. Well, my house of my wanderings because he had to wander from time to time, from place to place. They went after him, they looked for him, they wanted to kill him. Your mitzvot, your chukim, your statutes were for me like songs. They gave him that encouragement that he needed. They gave him hope. Zemirot, songs, music, very uplifting. If you're ever in a bad mood, don't listen to Persian music, because that's depressing. Okay? Listen to some good Latin music, Jewish music. Yes, music is very, very good to the soul, really. It can uplift you, it can depress you, it can really control your mood. So, even though he's talking here about Chukecha, your, your statutes, to him it was like Zemirot, because he began to understand things a little bit better with time. The more he learned, he says, wow, this makes so much sense to me. It's like a song. What is a song? It's a composition. Everything is harmony. When there's harmony, 
when everything is in tune, then it's beautiful. So that's why he's saying, as he was wondering, he had Torah. You know that a lot of Jews, thank God, had retained a lot of their learning by heart. So when they were stuck in jail or somewhere where there were no books, they were still able to continue to learn Torah. From memory. Sometimes entire Gemarot, entire Mishnayot, what a beautiful thing. And this gave them hope. Imagine not having anything, not being able to study for somebody who was used to study. Because they remembered it by heart, like Zemirot Ayuli, they wanted to be like a song that he can continuously sing and repeat. And this helped him when he was wandering from place to place. Next verse, Nun Hei. Zacharti Balayla Shimcha Adonai Vashmira Toratecha. 55. Here he talks about nighttime. You would think you would go to sleep at night. Well, not David and Menech were told did not sleep a lot. Basically, he's saying like this. At night, I remembered your name, Hashem, and I kept your Torah. But what's the difference between remembering your name and keeping your Torah? Well, remembering your name is prayer. The Vida Menech turned to Hashem in prayer during the nighttime. He said to him, and he also used part of the night for the Torah, the Shmira Torah Techa. Why the night? What's so special about the night? Maimonides, the Rambam, says that the best time for him to write his books was at night, when he was not busy. He was a doctor. He was very, very busy during the day. At night he had the time to be able to think, to be able to write, to be able to look into that which was difficult to perhaps comprehend and he could not concentrate very well during the day. Now he could. That was the night time. Now, obviously, most people are very, very tired at night. And so was David Melech. I'm sure he was very, very tired. But he forced himself to get up. And it's a known thing that David Melech got up very early. He didn't sleep a lot. It's a known thing about David Melech. He knew in advance that his life was very limited. He only had so much time to live. Could you imagine if you see a, an hourglass? You know what an hourglass is? The one that's full of sand? Right in front of you. And this is the amount of time that you have left to live. <laughs> I don't think you, you would be very calm. You would be worried it's almost about to finish. We don't see the hourglass in front of us, so we think we're going to live to 200. The rabbis tell us once you reach 50, and especially 60, look at the fact that you're about to return your soul to its maker. Life is almost over. The average lifespan is somewhere today in the late 70s, I think, in this country. So how much time do you have? 18 years, 20 years? It goes by very quickly. The Vida Man says, I know this better than anybody else, because I know how long I will live. He just didn't know which day he will go, but he knew. It's very limited. I've got to maximize my time, day and night. So it's not only people forget it, they think David Amalek was so in love with the Torah. He was in love with the Torah, of course. He was a very, very pure soul. And obviously, he was inclined to this. He understood this. And he understood the value of it. But he also realized the limitation of time, time constraints. And here he has a lot to accomplish. He was a judge. He was a king. He was a father and a husband. I mean, he had all those roles, too. So he prays to Hashem in the beginning of the night. And then he learns Torah as well. All right, next pasuk. Numva 56. Zot haitali ki fikudecha natsarti. All this came to me because I kept your precepts. So what does it mean, all this came to me? If you recall, he was concerned about several things. One of them was about the malchut, the reign, being king, that his descendants should be king. He was concerned that that may not happen. So he says, I was able to retain all of that. I was able to acquire all of that only because I made a commitment to observe your mitzvot and I stood by my commitment. A lot of people make commitments, but they don't carry it out. For whatever reason, it makes no difference. He carried it out. He committed himself to it and he sees the positive consequences of those actions. He's not attributing any of his successes to himself. It's all from Shammai. It's a Zotai Tali. 
from Hashem. Whatever I have, I tell it because I observe the Torah Mitzvot. A lot of people misunderstand. They think that they're geniuses, that they were able to turn over some investment to make so much money. They don't realize it's a mazal, or it could be something that is not so good either. People think wealth is always good. Sometimes wealth is to someone's detriment. As a result of him making all this money, this will make him fall. Or he will get hurt. People will be jealous of him. We should never always think or assume that wealth is a blessing. As Kohelet says, Solomon says, Yesh osher ha-shamu le-ba'alav le-ra'ato. There's sometimes wealth that is reserved for certain people. Le-ra'ato to his detriment. It's a curse, not a blessing sometimes. But here David Amir says, with what he always aspired, with what he had asked and prayed for, he got. But he attributes it to Hashem. He attributes it to his observance of the Mitzvot. It was in that merit that he was able to retain all of it. Next, verse 57. Chelki Adonai Amarti Lishmor Devarecha. Hashem is my portion, Chelki, and I pledge to keep your words. Very, very powerful. He's a king. Most kings are interested in amassing wealth, amassing fortune, conquering lands. The leader Mena says to himself and to us, Chelki, you want to know what I want? What I want to have? My chilek, my part, Hashem. That's all I'm interested in. I pledge, therefore, to keep your words. This is what interests me the most. As we will see towards the end, he didn't care about all the gold and silver. He realized what's really important for life. How does he determine that? Because he realized, though, that those people that amassed a lot of wealth didn't take it with them. You open up their graves, you won't see anything there. And if they did, there's grave robbers. <laughs> they will dig it up and take it eventually, if not the archaeologists. You don't take it with you. What good is all that wealth, all that money, to have all these buildings? Of course you're entitled to make a living, but is that the goal? He says, you want to know what Chelki was? Chelki is Hashem. I want to be close to him. I feel so good being close to him. In this world, of course, and in the world to come. Yes, this life is full of pleasures, a lot of pleasures. And those pleasures can cause many, many people to get carried away. More and more and more and more. The Vida Menach reminds us, Chelki, you want to know what my Chelik was, my part? Hashem. Pasuk Nun Chet 58. We're now in the middle of the letter Chet. Chiliti Fanecha Becholev Choneni Kimlatecha. I pleaded before you, <coughs> with all my heart, have compassion upon me according to your word. So, what is he saying here with Chiliti? I pleaded with you. He's adding the words Becholev, with all his heart. Hashem, as a result of me praying with all my heart, pleading, in other words, praying, I'm hoping that you will have compassion on me, Choneni, Kimratecha, as you have promise as you have said. <coughs> the lesson here is very clear. He pleaded, he asked with all his heart. The more we do things with all our heart, the more kavana, the more intent there is in the prayer, the more powerful, the more effective it will be. He's therefore expecting, I mean, not that he's demanding, he's hopefully expecting that these prayers will be answered. But still he uses the word honeni. Honani means compassion. In other words, have compassion on me according to your word that you promised. A lot of people sometimes don't have enough merits. Or there's accusations against them. For whatever reason, they did something in the past. They're not, they don't have a clean record. You know, somebody wants to get a job right now. Or he even wants life insurance. Whatever. There's all kinds of policies insurance or jobs that they will look into your past, your past record. You may not get the job, you may not get the policy because of something that happened in your past. It was that you broke the law. Even though it was a misdemeanor for a certain amount of years, it's in the records. 
So you need somebody to be compassionate. And say, okay, I realize you made a mistake. You were a young man, you didn't realize, you didn't know better. So David Amelech is not taking any chance. He's not so confident. He knows he did the right thing. At least Hashem, at least you know that my prayer was pure. It was, <coughs> it was with all my heart. And that's important. It's important for us to know that if it's done with all one's heart, it can make a difference. Still, I ask for Hashem's compassion. Another important lesson perhaps we can learn from this, when he says, Chiliti Fanecha, he's saying, I did my part. Hashem wants us to make a hishtadlut, as it's called in Farsi, a harikat. Make the effort, initiate, and Hashem will help. I initiated, the Yomel says, I pleaded with you, and I did so with all my heart. Therefore, I hope that my words will be well received. Pasuk nun tet, hishavti derachai vashiva raglai eledotecha. I contemplated my ways. Hishavti means to calculate, or to contemplate, to examine, I guess you could also say, and return my feet to your testimonies. This is very, very important. Chishafti, contemplate, calculate. Rabbis tell us, advise us, <coughs> you want to succeed in life, there's no way to anticipate everything. There's no way for us to know whether our actions will succeed or not, but at least do it right. Calculate, evaluate. What are you about to gain and what are you about to lose? Especially when you're in doubt. You're about to do something that is questionable. Maybe it's not right. Maybe it's not proper. Maybe it's not kosher. Maybe it's dishonest. Calculate. What am I going to get from committing a sin? What am I going to lose? I have a lot to lose. Oh, maybe it doesn't pay. For a few minutes of enjoyment, this is going to be expensive. Yeah, a lot of people don't realize that after certain things that they do in this lifetime, a few minutes of enjoyment, they get sick, sick from some disease as a result of committing something that's not proper, not right. I mean, and this affects them for the rest of their life. Was it really worth it? They regret it, of course, later on. Schara vera keneged efseda, and the other way around too, schara mitzvah. I have a chance, an opportunity to observe, fulfill this mitzvah. What am I going to gain and what am I going to lose if I don't do it? Poor man who needs some charity. And you have the money. You know what you're going to gain if you help him? You have any idea? A lot of people don't realize it. They simply forget. They say, come back tomorrow. Tomorrow he may not come back. Well, you may not be there tomorrow. So don't push it off. We're going to talk about that soon too. It's not a good idea to delay a mitzvah. So David Amelech here says, Chishavti derachai, I was that type of a person. Don't think I acted in an impulsive way. I wasn't a robot. I actually chishavti, I actually thought out things. I had doubts. I had issues to deal with. But I was very calculated in my ways. I didn't want to make a mistake. And I came to the conclusion, I'm always better off a shiva raglai ledotecha that I should return my feet to your testimonies. No, I, should, I, should stay, I should stay close to the mitzvot and not veer off. I realize that this is the best direction for me. Anything that tries to take me away from that is probably not a good idea. I'll give you a small example. Edotecha, your statutes, your testimonies. Torah, issue or a class. Somebody has an option whether to come to a class tonight or to have a turkey dinner even though I know it's tomorrow. I think it's tomorrow, right? What should he do? Turkey? <laughs> <laughs> There's no question. Go to the mitzvah, go to the Torah, go to Edotecha. What's the question? Can you compare? Of course, after the Torah, if you can still make it on time or have a little bit of that dinner, go ahead, fine. Nothing wrong with it. Cancel a whole Torah class because of that? How could you even think of doing that? Only because you did not do chishavta, you did not calculate, you did not calculate properly. How could you give up something like this? It's the biggest investment, so much reward for every minute of Torah. That is why a lot of people today who travel 
by uh, train in the East Coast subway, and they have all this time with them for the, uh, for the half an hour, hour ride. They take the tailing with them, they take some Gemara, they take some book, learn Torah. You're traveling anyway, what are you going to do now? And what do you think a lot of people do instead? They look at some movie in their iPhone. Movie? What is that going to give you? A few minutes of enjoyment? You know what you can accomplish in an hour with Torah? Every word that you say? But they don't know. But it's not only that they don't know. Even if they know, some of people do not calculate. That's what the Vedim is saying. It's important to calculate. And when I did, whenever I did, it always took me a little techa. It reminded me that this is more important. The statutes, the testimonies of Hashem. Pasuk Samach. Before we begin with Samach 60, David the Melech did have, by the way, despite his emunah, questions about why he was undergoing the suffering, why he was in pain, why he was being ridiculed. Why did he have to go through this? Even though he knew it's a challenge, but not always did he realize what was going on. The Chishati, when he calculated, also applies to that. And many, many times he thought it over and says, you know, I think this is coming to me because maybe I didn't learn enough Torah. The rabbis tell us that when a person does not learn enough Torah and he does have the time, then they keep him busy with other things. And those other things not only take his time, but they are also a form of an atonement for not having observed the mitzvot or not learned enough Torah. Samach, verse 60, talks about not pushing off doing things immediately. I heard and did not delay to keep your commandments. Yeah, definitely. We saw it with Abraham Avinu now in the parasha of the Torah. He was very diligent, he was quick. He realized that things have to be done right away, otherwise so many things can distract you and cool you off. It happens to all of us. We sometimes are in the mood, and 10 minutes later, the weather changes. Talk about the weather of the mood. You were in an excited mood, and now you're not anymore. So, when you're excited, do it. When you have the opportunity to do a mitzvah, don't push it off. He says, that's what I did. Chashti. Chashti means I hurried. I did not delay it, did not push it off. We're talking about after all the mitzvot. This may be the last time you have the opportunity to do something. If you don't do it now. It's not going to happen. I'll give, I'll give an example of what it means last time. People think, okay, I can do it tomorrow. I can do it. There's a mitzvah that really, you only have a few days to do it. You know which one that is? Mm Birkat -hmm. Levana, Which God willing will be doing next week sometime. The moon, the new moon. Well, if you live in some cities where the weather is not always that great, it's very cloudy, it's tough. If you have no rain, no clouds, then it's easy. Relatively. But sometimes, even in those cities that don't have too much rain, in the winter it's, okay, it's cloudy. And if you just push that off to another day, I say, I have, a few, I have a few more days, I can do it till the middle of the month almost. It may happen that at the, at the last day you can't do it anymore. It's cloudy, now what are you going to do? So there was one rabbi who took a, who took a helicopter mm -hmm. <laughs> and went above the clouds. Not all of us have the means to take a helicopter. But I had this situation several times, it happened. Several times it happened that uh, we were running out of time. And if I would wait and take a chance, I would lose it. It's a beautiful mitzvah. Now, if you wake up at 1, 2 o'clock in the morning, sometimes at that hour of the night, it clears up. The problem is you may not see the moon from where you are. So what did I do one day? I knew that the further east I went, closer to the desert, I had a better chance to see the moon. I wasn't seeing the moon here, we were closer here to the ocean. So I remember because I once went very, very far in the direction of Palm Springs, I remember that it became clearer and clearer, depending where. So it took me, that ride took me all the way to West Covina. By the time I reached West Covina, I stopped off at a gas station to save the when I was able to. But I had to travel. I couldn't do it if I couldn't wait from LA. It happened again a second time. West Covina was, was cloudy too. Right outside Palm Springs, I stopped on the freeway. On the freeway, I stopped. I didn't want to take a chance. 
on the freeway, on the shoulder. They stopped, they cut the Lebanon, right outside the city of Palm Springs. Then it happened the third time to me. This time I checked Google Maps. You can check to see the weather, the cloud cover. So I had that tool and I said, wow, all over Southern California it's cloudy. No matter how far I go, I won't be able to do it. Now what do I do? I got on a plane and I went to Phoenix. And at the airport in Phoenix, on the roof, I went up to, you know, where you can see everything. That's where I did the Kata Lebanon. I don't think I was able to do it right away. I had to wait till there was still a few clouds there. Somebody was looking at me, thinking, what am I doing there? Maybe he's a terrorist. You know, I, don't know. I was just waiting for my flight back, my return flight. And as soon as I finished, within an hour or so, I took my return flight to Los Angeles. Of course, it requires some self-sacrifice there, but so what? It's a beautiful mitzvah. It's a mitzvah that if you don't do it, you, you lost it. So how could you not do it if it's feasible? It's feasible. I didn't have to travel too far. I didn't have to travel to the moon. <laughs> right? Don't push it off. We're talking about Rishmon Mitzotech after all. Your life depends on this. Pasuk Samach 61. I'm reminded also. Pirkei Avot, we say, Ayom Katsar Melacha Meruba, if you recall. Life is short, the day is short, and there's so much work to do. Because we have so many commitments, so many things to do, if we don't pay attention to the mitzvot, some of the mitzvot will just disappear. In other words, they not be around when we turn around to see where they are. They just disappeared. A Yom Katsar day is short. Don't wait thinking that you'll have that opportunity later on as well. Rabbis also tell us, Oh, when I'll have the time when I retire, I'm going to learn. Who says you'll ever retire? You know how many people died after they retired? They thought that they, they had all these major plans. Right after they retired, within a year or two, they died. They're no longer active. We can't make such plans. Something which is right, do it right away. 61. Bands of wicked men. Bands, groups of evil men plundered me. According to one translation, they want to say that Ividuni, the word Ividuni is to plunder, to rob him, to hurt him, to take what was his. I don't like that translation so much. I would prefer the translation of the Aramaic here, which means they ganged up on me. It makes more sense to me. But either way, he was surrounded, he was persecuted, he was troubled by gangs of Rashaim of wicked people. Nonetheless, I did not forget your Torah. So, this is another challenge that he had to face from time to time. Not ordinary people, Rashaim, clearly wicked people, were after him. This was not an excuse. What did we begin to say? We're talking about many types of excuses that people can use as an excuse. I couldn't do it. They just didn't let me. They made fun of me. It's not an excuse. Somebody might say upstairs, you know, God, I was so rich, I just didn't have the time. You made me rich. And God will show you a lot of people that were a lot richer than him who didn't make time for Torah. Some will say, God, you made me poor. I was so poor. I just had to work hard for a living to bring food on the table. That's not an excuse either. I'm going to show you a lot of poor people in our history that still devoted time to Torah. It's not an excuse. So he says, don't think this is an excuse. Gangs of wicked people trying to give me a hard time. They ganged up on him. They tried to hurt him, bother him. It didn't impress me. See, there's a lot of peer pressure here. Be like us. Be part of the gang. And what do we say earlier? A lot of people fall for it. They can't take it. I didn't fall for it. I didn't forget about your Torah. All right, next, Pasuk. Sabbath bed 62. Similar to what we said before about the night time. At midnight, I rise to thank you for your righteous judgments. He gets up at midnight. What's so special about midnight? Well, anybody who's learned Kabbalah, anybody who knows about Tikkun Chatzot, anybody knows about the special prayers that are said then, 
that is a very propitious time. That is a time when there's warning for the destruction of the temple, for the Shekhinah. It's a very important part of the night. Kabbalistically, we, we won't get into that too much right now. All I will point out, however, is that in the Zohar, it does talk about the night in the following way. When Hashem sees that the Jews learn to write night, it makes, Hashem, it makes Hashem proud of him. Why? Because he tells all the angels, look, everybody else is sleeping, everybody else is playing around, everybody else is just wasting their time somewhere at night, and he's sitting down and learning. So because it is not as common for people to learn at that at night, to be doing something like that, it stands out in the upper world. It makes a very, very powerful impression. So besides the importance of Chatzot Alai being a propitious time, it also is significant because, look, this is what David was doing of all people. He was so busy and he made an effort to get up and to pray at that time of the night. As he says later on, he got up, I got up to thank you for your righteous judgments. What judgments? Well, obviously everything that was happening to him. He was grateful, realizing that it was all for his good, all for his benefit. He didn't complain. All right, next verse, Samach Gimel 63. I am a friend to all who fear you and to those who keep your precepts. This is easy. Tell me who your friend is, I'll tell you who you are. Hashem, I stick around only with good people. Those are the ones who are careful with the negative commandments as well as with the positive commandments. If you look at the verse, it's talking about those who fear you. That's the negative commandments. They're careful not to stumble with that which is wrong. Those that observe you, so that is the positive commandments. You know, some people just are careful with the negative, but the positive, they're not so excited, they're not interested. He was befriending the two, befriending people who were careful in the two areas. These were his friends, Haver Ani. Obviously, it's very possible for somebody to choose the wrong friend, very possible, because either he's his business partner, a neighbor, or whatever, even a relative. The rabbis tell us very, very clearly, be careful, be very, very careful who your friends are because they have a tremendous influence over you. Your surroundings, your teachers, your classmates, friends. Friends can be a powerful influence. So I make sure to befriend the right people. All right, next verse. This is the last verse with the letter Chet. Samach 64. Your kindness, Hashem fills the earth, teach me your statutes. Your kindness fills the earth. Well, Hashem is kind, the whole creation is an act of love, kindness. But he says, if you look everywhere, you have to look, you have to analyze, you will see all the chesed that there is in the world, all the chesed that Hashem does in the world. We wish that people would do chesed too. But he says, look at the world and you will notice the chesed that Hashem does. Abraham Avinu noticed it too. And that is why he taught this. He taught people this is the most important thing for God, that you are kind to each other. He wants us to emulate him. The way he is kind, he wants you to be kind. So I noticed that your kindness fills the land, the earth. Teach me your statutes. No? What does teaching your statutes have to do with kindness? Well, it means how the things that happen in the world are an act of kindness from Hashem. Because he sees a lot of things happening. And he realizes that Hashem is kind, but he doesn't understand how could this be kind when he sees death of somebody who is very young, leaving behind a widow and orphans. What's so kind about that? See what I mean? That is what he's asking for. Moshe Rabbeinu asked for the same thing. Please teach me, show me your ways. I want to understand your pikudecha. I want to understand your chukecha, your mitzvot, your statutes, your testimonies, because all of this has to do with some testimonies, some statutes, some law, some divine law. It's not only about the mitzvot of the Torah. We're talking about rules that Hashem has for 
how to run this world. Teach me. I see that it's all about kindness, but I'd like to see how. 65, Pasuk Samachhe. Now we're beginning with the letter Tet. Tuf tam vadad la medeni ki bimisvotecha imanti. 66. Teach me the goodness and wisdom of the Torah's reasons, for I believe in your commandments. This is similar to what we just said. He wants to have an understanding. He wants to have some sort of understanding of why is this mitzvah a mitzvah? Why did Hashem instruct us to do this? A lot of them we don't understand. They're chukim. They're decrees from Hashem. But look, he uses the word tuv here. Teach me the goodness, the goodness and the wisdom in everything that you ask us to do. I know it's good, but I don't see. I do believe a lot of people first want to understand before they fulfill. Fulfill the mitzvah. This is a divine law, even though you will never understand the reason for it. You take medication from the doctor even though you don't understand what it's all about. Even the doctor himself doesn't know what he scribbled. All he knows is that this is supposed to help you. But you don't ask questions. You don't second guess the doctor. So why are you doing it? Because he has a white gown and he has a diploma? and he barely passed when he was in college. You trust him, and you don't trust this. Your forefathers gave their life for this. But, nonetheless, you can still ask Hashem for direction, you can still ask Him to explain to you, I want to see how good this is. Show me that this is good and this is kind. Teach it to me. There's wisdom here. I'd, like, I'd love to learn. So David Amelech is t telling us here that this is something that we should all strive for. Strive to understand as best as we can. Hashem may not speak to us directly, but He can enlighten us. But you have to ask. You have to pray for it. This is something worth asking for. This is something spiritual. People don't really realize that when they ask for something physical, they may not get it right away. Hashem says, no, your parnasah is based on your mazah. You're not going to make more than $65,000 a year. That's it. It's this year. If you ask for a spiritual request, Hashem, help me perform the mitzvah. And help me find a marriage partner. These are spiritual. Hashem wants you to have those. He wants you to be able to do the mitzvah. He wants you to have a good teacher. He wants you to be married. Ask. Make your best efforts. Don't be too picky, of course. And don't do anything that is criminal in nature against the Torah that will bring upon you an accusation and ruin your chances of getting what you're asking for. So as long as you do everything right, there's no reason to suspect that Hashem is not listening. Why He still, nonetheless, did not give you what you need, only He knows. But we have to try. If we try, you'd be surprised. A miracle is going to happen. Keheref Ayn, in the blink of an eye. There's incredible, miraculous stories that prove this. We don't have the time. We can be here days and days and days sharing miraculous stories of people who prayed and saw miracles. So David Melech wants to see the wisdom, he wants to be taught the goodness of the Torah. Pasuk Samach Zayn 67 67 Before I afflicted myself, I would blunder, he made mistakes. But now I observe your word. So he admits that at one time he did blunder. At one time he did make mistakes. People have to realize that it's only human to make mistakes. So he understands that perhaps some of what he underwent, some of the affliction, is due to that. That he was not careful enough, perhaps, that he made mistakes. But ata, but now, in the Shabbat, now I do keep everything. Now I know better. Once upon a time, I didn't know better. But Hashem accepts our teshuvah. He says, it's okay, I understand. You didn't know better. At least you've tried the next time around to do it better. Don't repeat the same mistakes. Okay, I think we can go to the next verse. Tova tau metiv la medenu chukecha. That's Samachet 68. You are good and benevolent. Teach me your statutes. This is also something very similar to what we just said before. But there is a difference here. He says, Tova ta umetiv. You are good and benevolent. Well, the English translation of benevolent, I'm not sure, would do justice to this pasuk. Because tov means you are good, 
but metiv, more than benevolent, you actually do good. <clears throat> What's the difference? You're good to those that ask of you something, and metiv even to those who don't ask. <laughs> Hashem is not only going to be good to those who ask of Him a favor, to those who pray to Him, Hashem is benevolent even to those who don't ask, who may need something. But, if you look at the words, the end of the pasuk, he reminds us, you know when Hashem is for sure good, or for sure will listen to your prayer? When you ask for something like, la medeni chukecha, it's something spiritual in nature. Teach me. Your statutes, I want to understand your ways, I want to understand the mitzvot. That's something Hashem will help you for sure. If you ask for things that are more mundane, who's to say that you deserve it? Maybe Hashem won't want to give it to you, maybe it's not good for you. There's a story with the Chafetz Chaim. Chafetz Chaim was once asked, why doesn't God answer my prayers? And the Chafetz Chaim says, you know, we all have general prayers in the Sidur for Refua to be healed. We have prayers for Parnassah livelihood. There's one prayer where it begins with the word Shema Kolein. Listen to our voice. It's a general prayer where you can ask anything you want including marriage partner. However, be careful. Don't just ask for something specific because you never know if that's good for you. Ask Hashem, Hashem, you know what I need. Please give me what I need. That's better for the following reason. He gives a mashal as follows. There was once a father that told the grocery man, whenever my son comes home from school on his way home, give him some candies and I'll pay you for it later. A couple weeks later, the son got a very bad stomach ache. He had a lot of candies. And on that day, the grocer came to collect the money that he was owed. So he tells the grocer, not only did you give my son a stomach ache, you also asked me for money, but you told me to give him candy, and then you would pay me. Did I tell, him, did I tell you to give him as much as he wants? You must have given him a lot of candies. What do you expect? You knew that this would hurt him. It's not right of you. Now, if they would go to court, the father has a good case. He should have been smarter than that, not to give the kid as much as he wants. Now, Fetzheim says, when well, we head upstairs and we realize that what we asked for hurt us, harmed us in our life, we can ask God, why did you give it to us when you knew this would hurt us? And if, imagine, so to say, if we were to take God to court, so to say, we have a good case. Hashem doesn't want us to do that. He realizes that this is not right. So He's not going to give us usually something which is not right for us. It's always better you're safer asking for something general. I want to marry her. She may turn out to be a witch. You know that? She's going to give you a hard time. Are you sure you want it? Yes, I'm infatuated. <laughs> yes, infatuated is not healthy. You don't realize that sometimes. Be careful. Hashem, give it to me if she's the right one. If not, <laughs> please protect me from the wrong ones. That's better. Pasuk Samach Tet 69. The wicked have smeared me with lies, and I kept your precepts with all my heart. So even though people were accusing me of all kinds of lies, people were saying bad things about me, this did not stop me. It's another example of all kinds of situations where people fear and don't know what to do. Maybe they need to comply in order to get people off their back. And here David Amelik says, no, even though they spoke bad about me, they said lies, that did not dissuade me in any way. I still observed your misfort. This happened throughout our history. All kinds of people plotted against us, accused of, said lies. Blood lie was the biggest lie of all. It didn't stop us. Yes, we gave our life for it, regardless, despite the fact. So don't let that, that get in the way if people say lies, just because they're lying and you're trying to defend yourself. He observed them in Svod nonetheless. Seventy, their hearts grew thick as fat, but as for me, your Torah was my delight. They're ignorant. Fat means that they don't understand, they're completely ignorant. They fill their bellies with food, that's all they care about. And they became fat, not spiritual, very physical. 
And as a result of that, they have no clue, no understanding of what is right and what is wrong. But for me, the Torah Shiyashati, it was my delight. They didn't understand what's so beautiful, what's so special about Torah. What's this? This is antiquated. This belongs in a museum. <laughs> no. This is our life. Our life depends on this. Do you know that? If you don't learn, you will never know that. Therefore, I took delight in it because I knew how special it was. But they were tafash kachelim. They had all this fat in their head and in their stomach. Obviously, they're not going to know better. If you're into food, that's all you're going to care about. He was not into that. He was into the Torah. He realized how much more special it is. Ayn Aleph. Tov li ki chimunetit neman elmat chukecha. It is for my good that I was afflicted so that I might learn your statutes. He now realizes that all the affliction was for some good, it served some purpose. Rabbis tell us that be very careful with the poor, those who are afflicted, because leaders and giants of Torah will come out from them. Those who are afflicted, you never know. A lot of good souls can come out from them. And also they tell us those who work hard in understanding the Torah, they will be able to retain the Torah better. They will succeed in understanding it. They will succeed in retaining it because they worked so hard. They suffered in the learning of the Torah. So, Tobli Kunet, it's a good thing that I, I was afflicted, whether it's the afflictions that he received as an atonement or whether it's the hardships that he had in learning Torah because he was able to retain it a lot better because he worked so hard. Tobli Torah Pichem al it's the last verse, verse 72. That the Torah of your mouth is better for me than thousands of gold and silver. The most precious thing in the world is the Torah. There was one rabbi, Rabbi Yossi ben Kisma, on his way. He was approached by this gentleman. Rabbi, can you come to our town? We're going to give you a large salary of millions of dollars of precious gems and stones. Please join us. He says, you can give me all the money in the world. I will only go to a place of Torah. Wait a minute. How did he know that that place did not have any Torah? You know what the answer is? When a person speaks only about money, you can rest assured that there's no Torah. This is what he's trying to impress him with, with a big salary. I'll give all the money in the world away. I don't care for that. As we said earlier, you don't take it with you. What are you going to take with you? Your Torah and all your good deeds. Amen.